All right, so last chapter. We're done with principles one. Uh, so we only have one more class, one more principles. Okay, we have principles two, which will cover the remainder of the chapters in the textbook. All right, so we're going to talk tonight about listing agreements. All right, uh, so in this particular situation, we're going to talk about uh, distinguishing among the different types of listing agreements and their terms. Uh, we're also going to explain the listing process, uh, the parts of the listing agreement, and the ways in which a listing may be terminated. We'll also describe the uh, required property disclosures, the uh, circumstances in which each uh, disclosure must be given to the buyer, and any ramifications to the seller or the real estate agent for non-disclosure. We'll also identify the limitations on an agent's placing of code calls and sending fax and email advertisements to market real estate. Okay. Uh, so in that particular situation, there we go. Uh, so what we're going to start off with is in regards to the listing presentations. Okay. Uh, the listing presentation, all right, is the initial thing you're going to do when you go meet with the seller. So if, for example, if I'm going to go meet with, say, Mr. Keith to possibly sell his house, okay, then what I'm going to end up doing is, is I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do a CMA and I'm going to get all the paperwork together and I'm going to explain what I can do and why to choose me and all of this. But I'm going to also include in that presentation a listing agreement, okay? The listing agreement is the binding contract. Uh, that is basically expressed or implied. And we've already discussed that in many classes. Uh, again, they also are executed or executory. And they also are a contract. And since they're a contract, that means that they are valid, void, voidable, or enforceable. Okay, so the law of contracts apply to these agreements because they are a contract. Now, again, it creates a very special agency relationship between the broker and the seller. Again, if you notice here, broker and seller is who it's between. It's not between the sales agent and the seller. It's between the broker and the seller. Uh, and again, it must have a termination date. I'm going to add something in here. It must have a reasonable termination date. Okay. So you can't go, Travis, for example, that Mr. Eugene, you go and do a presentation to Mr. Eugene, you can't go to Mr. Eugene and say, well, I'm going to sign you in a 50-year uh, listing contract. Okay? Can't do that. Okay? Yeah, and, and Mr. Eugene, if, if he was to do that, you'd probably be like, it's going to take you 50 years to sell my house? Uh, I'm going to go somewhere else. Okay? So, again, the termination date must be reasonable. Now, Travis, would you say two years may be reasonable? Depending on the situation, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe it is a unique property. Yeah. And it might not take, you know, maybe the, when you did your CMA, you noticed the days on the market or that type is, something. yeah, 700 and something. Well, I need a long, long termination period. But what if it is like every other property in the neighborhood, they're selling 20 days? Do you think two years? No. Okay. So in that situation is, you want to kind of make certain that it's reasonable. It's not crazy outlandish, okay, uh, in regard to that final date. Um, again, there are different types of listing contracts. So after Travis has now came to you, Mr. Eugene, he's done his presentation. He's got his paperwork together. Mr. Uh, Travis is going to basically, it, well, it depends on his broker. The broker makes the decision. But if he wanted to, say his broker gave him full discretion, he could end up in that situation. He could give you an option to what's called an exclusive right to sell or an exclusive agency. Okay. Now we talked about this in a little bit in some other classes, but an exclusive right to sell, basically the broker is going to get paid no matter who sells the property. Okay. So Mr. Eugene, if you happen to find Stefan on your own, if you know y'all work together and you tell him you're selling your property and Stefan says, yeah, I'll buy your property in cash. Well, if you've already signed an exclusive right to sell with Travis, Stefan, even though you brought your own buyer, you still owe Travis or his broker a fee. Okay. Um, now, in an exclusive agency, it's where only one broker acts as the agent. So Travis may still be that broker, but if you bring a buyer, 
you don't have to pay a commission to it. Okay? So if you happen to say, you know what, Travis, I don't mind you listing my property. No, my, no, no matter what. However, Travis, if I procure my own buyer, then I'm not going to pay you anything because I did the work. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Is understand, Travis, if, if Eugene goes and gets Stefan from work and Stefan wants to put a contract in, are you wanting to do the paperwork? Do you really want to go and have to do all that paperwork if you ain't getting a paycheck? No. no. So what's going to happen, Mr. Eugene, is most likely, if he even does agree to it, what, what kind of standard do you think you're going to get? What type of quality that you're going to get from Travis if he ain't making a paycheck? Probably ain't getting too good of one. You're going to get the bare minimum. Yeah. The bare, bare minimum. Are you going to have him drive in a contract out to your house to have your signature? No, you're not going to get any of that. So when you sit down and you're talking to somebody to list your home, first off, I can just tell you, most brokerages will not even entertain this. Okay? And the reason being is this can happen sometimes. Travis may say, you know, Mr. Eugene, I want, to, I want to do an open house on your property. And you say, well, sure, Travis, come on, but I'm going to be at the open house. What's the problem with that, Travis? If he's at the open house while you're hosting it, and let's say there is a bunch of buyers that come in, I can't talk to you. you can't get everybody. So now what happens? Mr. Eugene's doing what? He's doing the top zone. Yeah, so here comes Aiden walking in, and you're over here dealing with Steph, and the next thing you know, Mr. Eugene, oh, well, come on over here, Mr. Aiden, let me show you the house, blah, 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 oh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, if, if you actually work with me, I don't have to pay him, so I can give you 30% off the sale of the house, so, so you know, how about you just work with me, and we'll just cut, cut uh, tracks out of this. Is there a problem there? I don't see one. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, but he does. And then and if he's my agent, I do too, because the thing is, is if he gets stuck in that contract and he still has to write it, he's working for free. And guess what? My liability is what, Travis? Through the roof. And we're not making no money. So what's the point? Okay. So in that situation is when you go to work with your broker, be very careful because some brokerages will tell you no. And some will say, yeah, we don't mind. The only time that you probably would do something like this is if you've been repeat with that client. Okay? You've been repeat with that one. However, understand, like I tell people, if I'm ever going to do that type of listing, understand, understand that if you find the person, you get to do the paperwork. So, Mr. Eugene, if you find Stefan, then you're relinquishing me from the contractual duties and you got to figure out the paperwork on your own. And if anything goes wrong, you're 100% liable. So there's no insurance because you're doing it yourself. The one positive about having a broker or an agent represent you is the fact of the matter is, is that with the exclusive right, if something goes wrong, my errors and admissions insurance jumps in. So if something goes wrong in your transaction, Mr. Eugene, guess what happens? You're getting free insurance over here because I'm having to pay for it. If something goes wrong, you come sue me. Okay. So there's that situation. Now, the next one in this particular situation is going into talking about an open listing. Okay. So we just talked about exclusive right and agency, but we're talking now about open listings. And this is the one that I highly am against. Now, that's me personally. There are other brokers out that will do this. But an open listing is, is that there's more than one agent, Mr. Eugene. Okay? So what happens is Travis works for me, Aiden works for Keller Williams, Stephen works for Century 21, and I work for Remax. Okay? Uh, so we all just work for different places. All right? So in this particular situation is you have all of us trying to sell your house. But guess what's even better? You yourself are also trying to sell your house. So what's happening is, is we end up in this situation, every one of us is trying to find you a buyer. Now, who does this favor, though? The seller. Favors you, the seller. It doesn't favor me. It doesn't favor Aiden or anybody else. It favors the seller. It does not favor anybody else. 
no one else, okay? But what happens with liability? Well, it's a big risk for a lot of people. Because what happens if Aiden and I and Travis and Stefan all send you a contract at one time? Could you possibly in the situation, if you were crooked, could you possibly say, yeah, I'm not going to take any of these? And then wait a certain time period and go back, reach out to them and sell the property and not pay commission. Yeah. It's outside of the protection period. So in that situation is you have to be very careful when you're dealing with these different types of listing contracts, these different types of agreements. So again, this shows you kind of an example of a nice little breakdown. As you see at the far, very far left, it's basically a for sale by owner. Okay, Mr. Eugene, you put it for sale by owner, you're selling it, but any brokers that possibly bring somebody in, you'll entertain it. Now, let me explain something, though, for sale by owners. I tell my agents this all the time. <laughs> if Stefan comes into my office and says, well, I've got a client that wants to see it for sale by owner, I'm going to tell him, very first thing you need to do is you need to call that for sale by owner and ask, are they even paying a buyer's commission? Because... When you sell your house yourself, Mr. Eugene, if you're selling your house yourself, you do not have to pay a buyer friend or buyer's agent. So you may say, no, I'm not paying a buyer's agent, period. Okay. So in that particular situation is, Stefan, are you going to want to show his property and he ain't paying no money? No. And if you go to, say, Aiden, he's representing you and say, hey, Aiden, you're, bu you're a buyer. I can show it, but you're going to have to pay me. What are you going to say? Well, that's his job. No, it's not. He refuses, so you're next in line. So then what's Aiden just going to do? Cut you out and go straight to Mr. Eugene. Okay? So there's your problem there. That's why whenever somebody talks about a for sale by owner, I pretty much say up front, somebody comes to me and talks to me, I just tell them up front, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not probably going to be able to be the one that can help you with a for sale by owner. Uh, the only way I can help you with that is if, if the seller will pay. Otherwise, you have to pay. Me. And I'll let them know that way up front when I do a buyer rent. Okay? I don't let them know that while we're searching. I let them know up front. Okay? Exclusive agency, as you can see, is Mr. Eugene, you put your sign out, but guess what? Travis put his out too. Okay? So now there's two signs out there. Now what's the problem with that? Well... If they call Travis and he's busy, what are they going to do next? Call, him. call Eugene. And then Travis, you're going to say, but I, wait, 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 wait. Aiden just called me and I just talked to him. And what are you going to say, Mr. Eugene? That's right. He called you, not him. That's right. So I don't, so don't got to pay you. See the problem. And do you ever want to be in conflict with your seller? No. No. Okay. So what's just the best way to do it? This one. This one. Exclusive right. Yeah. It, it just makes things, Mr. Eugene, I'm selling your house. That's what you're hiring me for. I mean, could you imagine if you hired an attorney and, and it was here in the middle? Y'all were y'all's relationship. Okay, now, attorney, uh, Aiden, uh, you're representing me in this murder trial, but I'm also going to represent myself. Okay, let's go. What's the problem with that? It's going to be a nightmare and a half. Okay? Not acceptable. Okay? Now, of course, the net listing is what they call, it's not permitted in Texas. But a net listing is this. Is where, say for this situation, Stephanie, you go out and you meet with Miss Leela. You do a listing presentation. And Miss Leela has taken my classes. And Miss Leela is, she's very knowledgeable, okay, of the real estate home matter here. So Miss Leela is very knowledgeable. She knows what we're talking about. She tells you, she said, Stephen, I want you to sell my house for $200,000. Anything over $200,000, you can have it. Okay? Well, what is that? That's a net listing. Now, if she's a knowledgeable, knowledgeable person, okay, she knows her stuff. She's probably done her research. But what happens if you go to Garrett? And Garrett don't know crap about real estate. So Garrett goes over, and you go talk to Garrett, and Garrett says, well, I really just want to make, you know, get $100,000 for my house. That's all I want. And you, Stephanie, know that his house is worth $500,000. So 
So he signs a net listing agreement where he just wants to sell it for $100,000 and Steph, you have any big over it. Well, what happens? Yeah, yeah, deal. At closing, deal. you're getting $400,000 and Garrett's walking away with a hundred. Garrett, you happy about that? And then I'm leaving state. Garrett, he, he's, he's stunned right now. He, he, he doesn't know what to say, okay? So in that situation is, is that it's not permitted in Texas unless these elements happen, okay? Number one, the principal has to actually require it. Does not mean that you get to force it on them. It means that the principal tells you, this is what I want to do, okay? And a person that requires a net listing, do you think they're knowledgeable? Yeah, no. They're very knowledgeable. They know, they've already probably done their, they probably actually are a realtor in another state or another county that doesn't have access to yours. They've already kind of basically figured out what it's worth. And they're just telling you, hey, I know it's worth 250, but I'm gonna go over in there and sell it at, you know, 245, and uh, you can have anything over 245. Because I know, that you're only going to make how much money? Possibly $5,000. Okay. A, a dumb person is not going to require a net listing. It's going to be somebody that's educated. Okay. Or somebody that wants to transfer money without having to do a gift. So your mom, Travis, may say, Travis, I end up, I want to sell my house for $100,000. And anything over a hundred thousand dollars goes to you. Okay. Well, in that situation, what's happening? Well, the money's transferring to Travis, but is it transferring as a gift? As a gift? No, it's transferring as a business transaction. So her, your mom could do what? Well, she could say, "I paid four hundred thousand dollars in in broker fees, and basically the money does what?" funnels over to you without having to worry about taxes. Well, you still have to pay income tax, yeah. but gift tax, okay? But again, it's not, again, these are just different ways and hypotheticals. I, I kind of go off in different tangents in some situations, but that would only be beneficial if your mother had already exhausted her gift tax. You see what I'm saying? Or inheritance, okay? Um, the principal is also familiar with the current market values and the broker must advise the seller of the broker's price opinion or a comparative market analysis. <laughs> now, if you notice there, what's that word right there say, Stephen? That one. Broker. So in a net listing, the broker actually has to do the CMA, not the sales agent. Okay? Because the broker has to be involved in the, in the net listing. Now, a multiple listings is basically uh, it's the obligation to distribute listings through a MLS, a multiple listing service. And what this is, is after I have a contract with you, Aiden, for example, uh, to sell your house, would you want me to just put it on my website or do you want me to share it with everybody? Everyone. Why do you not want me to just put it on my website? That's how many people look at your website. That's right. That's the thing. See, I want to share it on my website only because of what reason? My website, guess what also? What's the chances of me getting that buyer too? Very high, very high. But if I share it with everybody, including on Travis's website, he owns uh, TX Realty, we're two separate firms, what's the possibility of me getting the buyer? It's now in half now, isn't it? Because what just happened? Travis has it on his website, which now Mr. Eugene finds it on there and then contacts Travis because he ain't calling me. And then all of a sudden now, the buyer goes to who? To Travis, not to me, okay? So there are brokers in some situations that don't want things to go on the MLS. They want it only on their website. Because if it's on their website, what happens? They get the listing, they get the lead, okay? Now the obligation to distribute listings, again, are through the MLS. There is an offer of cooperation and compensation to sub-agents or buyer's agent, okay? Meaning that when I signed up as the broker, the designated broker for Nobles Realty Group, 
when I signed up for that, I agreed when I joined BMLS that I agree to compensate the other parties that are in the transaction. Does that make sense? So I, I agree to compensate. Now, again, when obtaining listings, of course, you're going to have the information about brokerage services form, which is required, mandatory. Okay. Real quick, do you have to go pay that? In regards to the CMA, there also has to be a CMA done. There needs to be a property profile, a listing agreement, and any disclosures. These are your bare bones of getting a listing. Okay. Now, again, the listing contract or agreement is going to have the legal names of all parties, the broker's name as on the license, the type of listing agreement, the legal description, the property be, to be excluded. So at some point while you're going through, and this is very key as well when you're doing a listing presentation, is you wanna go through the property and ask the client, is there anything in particular that you want to exclude? So I may walk through this office, say this was your house, Mr. Eugene, and this is your movie room. And I notice that the projector is hooked up to the, the, the ceiling here, okay? Well, that should be something as an agent that I should do what? Mr. Eugene, do you plan to take that with you? Because here's the thing, is if I don't ask Mr. Eugene that and I let people start walking through the house, they're gonna think it goes with it. Because of the fact of the matter is, people don't understand how these projectors are installed. People think, Oh, that's bolted to the, the structure and it can't come down. No, not really. Not really. I know I was one of those people a long time ago before I actually saw Travis's grandfather put this up for us. I, I never knew how they work. I used to think they were like bolted, screwed in, and like, you know, it couldn't come down. After I saw how much it is, it's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. Okay. But from a lay person, they think what? That's, that's staying, that's conveying. So what I tell people all the time is, is that when you are going through a listing, you should walk through the house with the client and say, is there anything in this particular room that you wanna take? And if Mr. Eugene says, I want that projector to go, then what does that mean I should tell him? You need to take it down before we list this property. And he's gonna say, but I don't wanna do that because you know I watch my movies in here. Well, Mr. Eugene, if you do that and you leave it up, there's a potential that there could be conflict over this. So now I could, of course, exclude it. But ultimately, when people walk around through the house, they don't think about that. And agents don't always share that information. And so they just assume that's going with me. Okay. You also need to come up with the listing price. Now, what happens here, and, and I guarantee you, every one of my agents sitting in this room right now can tell you, what happens if your client says, I want to sell my house for a million dollars and it's located in Iola, Texas with, you know, two, three acres? It's going to be listed for a million dollars. It's going to be there for a But what, wait a minute. It's going to be worth, the, you're going to list it for a million dollars, but it's not going to sell. No. So shouldn't no. you just leave that listing, just move on? No. no. What can you get out of it? Marketing. Marketing. You can get leads. See, a lot of agents, they'll see a listing and be like, yeah, that's a crap listing. I'm not going to. No. Put your signs up. Because you put your sign up, what else is out there? Your name and number. And that's how you get leads. Okay. So again, should you just let your client willy-nilly put numbers on them? No. That's why we come back here. That's why we come back here. Let me see if I can't find it. Right here. Uh, that's what we're talking about, obtaining okay, listing CMA. If I do a CMA and I give it to you, Aiden, and I say your property's only worth $200,000, and you tell me, screw you, it's worth a million, I'm gonna say, hey, here's the CMA, sir. Here it is right here. And if he says, no, I want a million dollars, then what do I do, Travis? Is that good? 
That's what you said. I have given you the CMA. You've been notified. You declined it. I will list your property, but I want you to understand this is what your property is worth. So don't come calling to me <coughs> down the road when you went over and you declined to put the price in there. And 90% of the time, if I take the client in regards to their listing price, if Aiden tells me it's a million dollars, I'll say, Aiden, I'll make you a deal. I will go in and I'll list it on the MLS for a million bucks. However, every two weeks, we will reassess to drop the price. So I'll list it, but in two weeks, if it doesn't end up, if we don't get no looks, no showings, no nothing, we drop the price. And sometimes if I know it's that far apart from 200 to a million, I'll say, you, get, you agree with me that we will drop it $50,000. Not gonna say 10, not gonna say 20, 50. Or if it's really far, I may even say 100. So if there's no showings, two weeks, we drop it from a million to 900. There's no more showings in two weeks, it's going to 800. And eventually, what am I going to have happen, Travis? Eventually, I'm going to get where? Down to where, you, down to where I need to be. Yeah. Right? And then at that point, I'll start getting offers. So that's why when you're doing these listing agreements, you've got to think around the box. Okay? You've got to think outside of the box. You also have to have the terms of the listings. Again, you have to have that definite ending date. And I put an unreasonable date in there. Again, it also is going to talk about the brokerage fees, how much the broker is going to charge. It's also going to talk about the broker's protection period. The protection period states that, Mr. Eugene, that after our listing terminates, I have a certain period that if any of my people I've showed the property to you has come back and puts an offer in, I'm still entitled to a commission. It's basically insurance. Okay. So if that property, I showed Steph in your property back in January, and now our inspection or our termination has occurred, well, I have from today out 60 days for Stefan to, if he comes in and puts an offer in, I'm still entitled to a commission. Have I had that happen? Many times. Okay. Because what happens is Stephen may have went and looked at the property, but he needed to save up the money to go and do that. So he might have worked two months so he could come up with the down payment to buy the house. So Stephen now made the money, got the down payment. Now he's ready. Well, our termination has occurred. So he contacts you. He tells me about it. I'm going to call you and say, that's my client. Where's my money? Okay. An agency relationship is also created. The moment everybody signs, there's that agency. Okay, which means it's what type of relationship? Oh, fiduciary. Fiduciary relationship, which is the highest and best. Okay. The broker's authority and responsibilities are broken out. The seller representation is stated. And the limitation of liability is included, meaning that if somebody ends up gets injured on Mr. Eugene's property while I'm selling it, Mr. Eugene, you're liable for it. You're limiting my liability. Okay. And of course, other agreements can be stated. Now, again, of course, this is what everybody's worried about right here is the commission. Okay. What happens is, is you have to be aware of how are we going to work out the commission, the price, and the rate? All of these are needing to be taken into play. You have to, when you get a client that, and this kind of comes to that point, if you're weak in math, this is that point. Okay, if you're weak in math, this is that area that makes it difficult. So say, Travis, that you end up, I come out to you and I say, I want to sell your property, and you want to list it 100000 higher than what the CMA is. Now, while I would love that as a commission, the problem is, is what's happening is it's really draining you of money. Because, see, people don't think about this. If I list Travis's property 100,000 higher, put it up over 100,000, that property's probably going to sit 12 months. Now, if he's paying a mortgage on it of $1,000 a month, how much is that, Aiden? $12,000. Now, 
Is that all he has to pay when you own a property? Just just your mortgage, nothing else? No, it also comes with it. Taxes. What about, do you need like heat, electricity? You need those things? Utilities. Do you have maintenance? Repairs? HOA. You seeing the, what's happening here? So that 12 months might end up costing Travis, what? Fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for all that wonderful stuff. So the thing that you have to sometimes do is you have to ask Travis, do you really want to put it on the market a hundred thousand over and incur a hundred thousand more in debt? Or do you want to go ahead and let's drop it to where it needs to be so you can get out of this as quickly as possible, move to your next house, and not have to incur that debt? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, what about the termination of listings? How exactly do we terminate a listing? Well, the very basic one is if Mr. Eugene Travis signs a listing contract with you and he sells the property, what have you done, Travis? You performed it, didn't you? You performed that sale. You completed the sale. So he performed by the broker. So Travis, in that situation, he completed the performance. He did what he promised he was going to do. And guess what? He sold the house. Okay. Now the expiration of the listing, that could be just the time frame has lapsed. It could be a unilateral revocation. You see that again? Unilateral revocation by the broker or the seller. Did I say and? No. Mr. Eugene could say, Travis, you suck, you're fired. Okay, it's done. Or Travis could say, Mr. Eugene, you are the worst damn son I ever dealt with. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, it, it, it could be either way. Okay. But if, if you noticed, uh, a, did I ever say bilateral? Nope. No, what did I say? Unilateral. And that means how many people? One. Just one. Okay. There could also be destruction of the property. Eugene could have uh, gone out there and he was in his shed working and caught a fire and burnt the whole house down. Oh. Okay. Guess what? Destroy the property. Or there could be a change in use. Zoning could have occurred. Change of zoning. Can't sell it residential anymore because now it's commercial. Right? If there's bankruptcy of the seller, then in that situation is pretty much done. If there are mutual agreements of the parties, now the parties could both be in consensus of saying, you know what? I'm not going to represent you anymore. Yeah, I agree. Okay, we're good. Or there could be just death or incapacity of either party. Okay. Now the <coughs> seller's disclosure. Now, is this an important form, Stephen? So this isn't important, is it? Why is it very important? You need it for every listing. It tells you what what's wrong with the property or what what the property has its future. So you mean this is important? Yeah. No, nah, you don't. You think Aiden, this is important? Travis, it's not important, is it? No, not at all, right? Yeah, I mean, who would want to know what's wrong with the property? <laughs> Nobody would want to know that. Okay. the first thing Yeah, very first thing. Where's the seller disclosure? Uh, yeah, exactly. How is the I have a question. Yes, Miss Leela. It's required to have a seller disclosure. Excuse me. Is it required? Yes, it is required, except for the ex exceptions that I think we might. Let me see. I'm trying to go through here. It's like we're all land. Yes, there are some. We're going to talk about that actually here in a minute, Miss Leela. Okay, I'm thanks. About the seller's disclosure. But yes, it is required in majority, I would say 90% of all transactions. Okay. And we'll talk about that as we move along here. But good question. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about the seller's disclosure. We're also going to talk about lead based paint. Now, guys, all y'all in here, let's go. What year does everybody need to burn in their head right now? 1776. What did you say? Nothing. <laughs> Ignore Stefan. And what was that, Aiden? 1978. 1978. Okay. 1978, if a house is built prior to that time, you have, keyword, have to get it by lead based paint disclosure. No ifs, ands, buts. Okay. We'll talk about that as well. There's also the notice of additional tax liability, the conditions under the surface disclosure, and memberships in the property owners association. 
Further, in the seller's disclosure, there can be discussion of potential annexation, meaning that, Mr. Eugene, you may be trying to buy this property that Aiden has listed in Navasota, and you're like, man, I'm buying this because it's like really on the on the, the outskirts of College Station. So I'm going to buy it and cheap prices, cheap everything. So I'm going to buy it. Well, do you want to know if College Station is possibly going to annex that location? Why well, do you want to know that? Well, you might put something next to it, like a far, uh, apartment complex or something. Uh, I don't know here. Is your taxes going to go up? Oh, okay. God. Yeah. Why would they go up? Because they built that. Right you're, part of, you're part of <laughs> College Station. What about your utilities? They're the roof. Okay. So sometimes you want to know, is there going to be a potential annexation? And, and cities do that. Cities will come in and, and annex parts of the properties. And if you do, and you get annexed out by a big city, guess what happens to all your costs? Through the roof. There's a reason some people sell. They know that their property is about to get annexed. They want out. Okay. There also is unimproved property in a basically certified service area, statutory tax districts, as well as notice of water level fluctuations and Gulf Coast counties. There also can be public improvement districts. Sometimes there's a need for what's called a mode remediation certificate and there can be residential property that's encumbered by lien. Okay. So in the seller's disclo disclosure notice, the owner must, keyword, must disclose all material facts that are not discoverable by the purchaser using ordinary care. So what does this mean? Well, say Miss Leela about five years ago, say her water heater is in her attic and she lives in a two-story house. And say that, God forbid, that her house, you know, the, the water heater started leaking. It ended up, it rotted the wood, and eventually the water heater collapsed through the ceiling on the second floor and flooded her second floor. Okay. Well, in that particular situation, Miss Leela's going to do a what? She's going to file. Miss Leela, what are you going to do if, if that was to happen at your house? What, what are you going to file? Uh, <laughs> what type of claim? Oh, you're talking about the insurance claim? Insurance claim. She's going to file an insurance claim. And so once she files the insurance claim, what happens next, Mr. Eugene? They send a what out? They send a crew out. So they'll send out a crew. So Mr. Aiden, they notified you. They send a crew out. You go out there. You fix it all up. You paint it. You clean it. You get her all back to normal. Now, the question now is, is this, is would Stefan, who wants to buy her property, would you be able to know that her water heater had fell through her ceiling if it's been remediated? No. No. No, you wouldn't. So the situation is, who's the only one that would know that information? Miss Leela. So in that situation is, it's not going to be discoverable by an ordinary purchaser. But is that something important, Travis, to a client? Is that a material fact? Did that make Stefan think, think differently about her house? Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's a material fact. Okay. So in that particular situation is she would have to disclose that on the seller's disclosure so that she can notify Stefan. So Stefan can do what? Make a decision. Do I want to deal with this? Okay. Also, the owner must disclose that a reasonable investigation would not undercover. So that's another thing, Mr. Eugene, say that you have termites. <coughs> if you are a normal person, do you know what to be looking for for termites? No. And sometimes even experts can miss them. Okay, sometimes they can even miss them. So in that situation is, is if you know you have termites and you don't disclose it, that can get you in trouble too. Okay. It is required in almost all residential transactions, all of them. And the owner must deliver on or before the contract effective date. And I'm going to tell you something. In my office, a seller's disclosure should be completed when? Before. 
before before I just in contract yeah. you even put in. I prefer that they're all done when you're in a listing presentation. Yeah. But as my agents know, when you do a listing presentation, you if you're waiting on them to do a seller's disclosure, you're going to be sitting there the whole day. Okay, so it's best that you do what? Give them the form, but stay on top of them to do what? To get the form to you. Okay. Again, if not delivered on or before the contract effective date, guess what happens? The owner has limited time to provide the notice. So if you already have a client that say, Travis, you're told eight and get this to me. You know, you talk to him Monday, you said, I need it by Friday. And, and Aiden's like, okay, I'll get it to you. And he doesn't get it to you Friday. And then you call him Saturday. I'll get it to you to Sunday. Sunday, you don't have it. You call him Monday. He's one of those clients. When you put Aiden under contract, do you think he's even going to meet this limited time frame? No. So what is the best thing you do? Aiden, I've got a contract here, but before I'm going to allow you to sign it all, I need that seller's disclosure. Because here's why. The buyer may still terminate the contract, okay, for any reason within seven days after receiving the notice. So if you allow Aiden to sign the contract and actually get under contract without the seller's disclosure, you are giving that buyer free reign to walk away for any reason seven days after the day you give it to them. So imagine, Aiden, you don't get it to them till 10 days, say you get it to them after their option contract. Okay, 10 days is gone. So you got 10 days have passed by. Guess what happens? You got your 10 days that have passed by, and here we go, you ready? Now we flip over here, we have our 10 days, now you get it to them on that day. Now they got an extra seven days that they can back out. So you just gave them basically the entire transaction as a free option. Ain't that nice? Yeah, I mean, yeah that is very nice. For the, for the buyer? Then, yeah. What about you as a seller? Oh, that's not what I want. No. Okay. So for my side, if I'm working with the buyer, what do I want? Yeah, 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 yeah. But if I'm the seller, what? Nope. Nope. Again, disclosure is not required, however, for death by natural causes, suicide, accident related to property condition. Okay. You are also disclosure is not required for sex offenders, but are not prohibited though from doing so. You're not, you don't have to tell them, but you're also not prohibited. And again, this is the seller, not you as the agent. Okay. If they have AIDS or HIV, you cannot disclose. They are a protected class under the Fair Housing and they are classified as a handicap classification. Again, unusual occurrences, though, must be disclosed. Okay. What's an unusual occurrence? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> uh, it's been worded in a way of saying things that are not normal. So not just in the situation of when I'm talking about not normal, I'm not just talking like ghost spirits and things of that. I'm saying that if there's theft or if there is parties, things that a person normally would not expect, if that makes sense. So a shoot, people, a shoot a cannon on an hour of every hour. That's right. Huh. Yes. Okay. Things that are not your normal, like when you buy a house, you understand some people are going to have parties here and there and all of that. We all understand that. But if it is every hour on the hour, there's a party or there's somebody shooting a, shooting a gun or whatever, that stuff or a train that comes by every other hour and blows the horn, that stuff needs to be disclosed. Mm. Okay. Because it's a nuisance is what it comes down to. Okay. okay. But yes. Unusual occurrences is just things that normally what you would not expect in, a, in an area. Good question, though. All right. Lead-based paint disclosure. Now, all my agents that are here right now, every one of them here, the lead-based paint, that's not that's not going to be on your test, right? Right, Yeah, it, <laughs> 1978 ain't going to be on your test, right? It will? 
Hey, it wasn't on yours, right? Sure was. Why was it on yours? It was on both. Now, not Stephen's. I know it wasn't on Stephen's. It was on yours, too. He's got one. <laughs> yeah, he got it wrong. He put 1976. That's right. 17, oh, 1776. <laughs> but in the situation is, what happens? Lead-based paint, again, is going to be required on properties that are built prior to 1978 with few exceptions. Okay? Do you see a house built in 1978? Should you give a lead-based paint disclosure? I said it was built in 1978. What does the law say? Prior or before 1978. Do you think it hurts to throw that form in there just in case? No. No. It's always better to give more than not enough. Okay. Now, real estate agents must retain a copy for how long? Three years. Okay. If tested and found free of lead, then guess what? Don't need the disclosure. If it's not tested, okay, it's not, or not, if it, it is not required to test, remove, or abate, it just means you need to disclose it, okay? So in that particular situation, you need to make certain that as you're going through this, that it is not required to test, remove, or abate, but just simply to disclose, okay? Now, the renovation, repair, and painting, okay, this is the RRP regulations, Renovation or repair of more than six square feet of the interior or more than 20 square feet of the exterior is classified as basically renovating or repairing. Okay, that's what it's classified as. Now, it must be done by a certified renovator. Can you put it on pause for a minute? Okay. So, again, you must use a certified renovator, okay, and they must give renovate right pamphlet before the beginning, and the owner may repair the owner-occupied property, okay? So, you, Mr. Eugene, you can repair your own property, but if it's an investment property, guess what ends up happening? You got to use a certified person, okay? Now, the seller's disclosure also has a notice of additional tax liability, okay? Uh, and it's just a notice, but it says that the sellers of vacant land must disclose the possibility of the potential of rollback tax liability, okay? And if disclosed, required, and not made, then the seller is responsible for those additional taxes. So if it's not put in there, then Mr. Eugene, you can pay all those rollback taxes, okay? The conditions under which the service disclosure occurs, they're required by sellers of unimproved land unless the seller is obligated to deliver a title commitment. The disclosure of pipes for natural gas and unrelated or and related products must also be stated. If the property is going to be in a membership in a properties owners association, this also must be stated. It's required to give a purchaser written notice that the purchaser must be a member of the association. The copies of any restrictions are going to be filed with the county clerk, and the purchaser must pay the assessments. So non-payment, of course, as we talked the other day, does what? It could result in a lien on the property, which is then <laughs> going to be foreclosed on in your house. So, okay. We also talked about potential annexation. This is where sellers are going to be outside the city limits, must provide written notice that the property may now or later be included into an ETJ or may now or later be subjected to annexation. What these basically are, are these are different areas that are being brought in to a different area that they were initially with, different city, different county. If it is unimproved property, there is a certified service area, which is required in the sale of unimproved property that's located in a retail utility provider service area. There is a written notice, which is the extension of water or sewer services that might require additional expense. 
the utility might be delayed in getting service though to those properties. And that's, by the way, that's very important because sometimes you may buy some land, comes back to the whole saying, the old saying, if it's cheap, you're getting what you're what? Paid for. So sometimes you may have bought some land, Stephen might have bought some land for 5,000 bucks. Stephen's happy, right? Got 5,000, got him some land. But guess what the bad thing is? There's no water or sewer out there. The nearest place is like 15 miles down the road. So if you want water or sewer out there, guess what you get to do, Stephen? Pay for plumbing. You get to pay for the, the connection from there all the way out to your property. I imagine that's pretty expensive. Oh yeah, very expensive, okay? So again, in that situation, very important. I actually had a, a property I was selling, it was over 30 acres. And the nearest one was 15 acres or 15 miles down the road. And we were looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, so not cheap because you had to connect on. A statutory district or tax district, the property can be in what's called a municipal, a municipal utility district, which is a MUD. And it's required to furnish statutory notice, all right? And there's the district tax rate, the bonded indebtedness, and the standby fee, okay? Now, the propane gas system service area is going to use the promulgated addendum to notify the notice if that property is going to be within that area. Again, there can be special cost, and there may be a period of time to build the lines or other facilities <coughs> to provide the gas service in those particular areas. Another notice is your notice of water level fluctuations. If a property happens to adjoin an impounded or basically a Larry, an area where the water can go up and down through maybe a dam or through natural causes uh, that has maybe in some situations a storage capacity of at least 5,000 acre feet, then the seller must give the buyer a statutory notice. And that notice is in the track contract. Again, most of these notices are already written in there. You remember for my guys that are listening now, when you look at the one to four family, I think it's page eight, I believe, I can't remember, but it's paragraph 12 is where most of it is. It's just a bunch of notices and there's nothing you type. This is it, this is it, okay. Um, the Gulf Coast counties, uh, the Texas open beach law states that the Gulf Coast beaches from mean low tide to vegetation line are gonna be open to the public. Any structure becoming seaward of that vegetation line, guess what? Can be removed. So that means that something moves, it can be subjected to, remo or to removal. The coastal area property notifies the buyers of restrictions on use and development of the property that's adjoining tidally submerged lands. The public improvement district, the PID, basically states that it's a project to re uh, revitalize a community. And this happens a lot in, in areas that have been put down and not basically been brought up. It's basically a project to revitalize a community. It must disclose that properties in the PID pay annual assessments for the maintenance of those improvements. Uh, and so it's basically trying to get the community back up and going again. Okay, it's, it's like in Houston, as they keep building out and out and out, what happens to the inner parts? A lot of times those inner parts are just left and vacated and they keep moving out. Sometimes they'll do a revitalization to try to get people to come back to that area, okay? Mode remediation certificate. If mode damage is remediated, then the purchaser must receive certificate of mode remediation that's issued within the last five years. The residential property can be encumbered by a lien, and we all understand that for mortgages and all of that, but if a lien will not be released within 30 days after the sale, then the seller must deliver a notice of lien. And that states that it must state that the lender could demand full payment on the outstanding balance in the transfer. Common sense here, you're gonna sell your property, the money has to be sent where? You gotta go pay your mortgage, okay? So you don't get to just transfer it and not pay the mortgage company. The mortgage company has to be paid. There also is a private transfer fee obligation if real property is subject to a private transfer fee, then the seller must provide the notice of that potential purchaser. 
Again, failure to give the required notices may allow the buyer to guess what? Terminate a contract for any reason. So if Mr. Travis doesn't provide me all of the, the terms and everything on disclosures, I may say what? I, I'm out. You didn't disclose this to me, so I quit. I'm out of here. Okay. So you have to reiterate this to your clients that they have to be open and honest. Don't conceal stuff. If you lie to me, you're going to get yourself in trouble. And I, I've seen it. What about marketing? Marketing and promotion. Well, is this a big thing, Travis? Marketing promotion. Why do we, we don't need this. Y'all, Mr. Eugene, you don't want me to set a house. I mean, all you want me to do is put a sign up, put it on the MLS. That's it, right? Uh, I'm paying a lot of money, so I want you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. Aiden, help me here. I'm kind of confused here what, by what Mr. Eugene said. Okay. Help me here. Okay. He's paying me $50,000 to sell his house. Okay, because it's you know it's it's a 1.5 million dollar house here, okay. and he's making me sell his house. He's gonna pay me fifty thousand. Isn't me just putting a sign in the yard and only that's all I need to do, right? Yeah, that's fine, man. Not hard. Not with that fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. A whole lot more. Yeah, that's a good thing, you right? Better get out and give me a whole bunch of help. You better put signs up, market like crazy, fella. Or you ain't getting nothing. <laughs> give me half, I'll drive you out there. Oh, you're, oh, well, there, there we go. He'll drive me. There we go, Mr. Eugene. He'll drive me. Ain't enough. Ain't enough. Ain't enough. So, so you mean I actually have to try to sell your property? Yeah, pound the uh, pound the uh, the payment is you can get. Stephen, they want us to work. I thought we just get free money. No. No, 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 no. That's not how this works. That's what I'm saying. That's what free I thought, money. right? Right, Leela? Yeah. Yeah, we're just supposed to sit in our sit behind there and enter it in the MLS and call it a day. No, not work like that. A, man, no. this just this throws me for a loop. Well, it's good. Now get after it. You know what the sad thing is? Probably I would say 70 to 80 percent of most real estate agents think that's it. That's all they do. Yeah. Well, I put a sign in the yard and I put a lockbox on it and I, I put it in the MLS. That's all I need to do. No, you're paid for what? to market to sell that property see that's not a lot of people that's what they do i would tell you 70 to 80 percent of the realtors that i know today that is what they think they do i put it in the database it goes on the mls and i just wait for another agent to bring me a buyer that's it pretty simple right no it is basically in this situation is it is your duty okay to market and sell that property. If you actually read your contract, I actually sometimes have my agents read their contract. It states that you do not just put it in the MLS. You actually have to go sell that property. You got to market it. So again, the very first thing you got to jump into is you got to look, and this is what's happening now. Online marketing used to a full service broker was when you came to a broker, the broker did what? Well, the broker, after they did a presentation, number one, the broker, their first thing was, of course, put it in the MLS. After they put in the MLS, they put a sign up, they put their lockbox on it, and then guess what happened? They would go put it in the newspaper, in the magazines, they would go around town and put it in very popular areas, put flyers around town, and they put all this stuff all over for that one particular property. Now, why would they do that? Well, they were classified as a full service broker they did it all okay but over time we've had this discount internet realtor come up which has caused this problem this fizzbo see what's happening is is people like mr eugene he has a 1.5 million dollar house he wants so and he hired me and I went over and I just put it on the MLS, put a lockbox on it, and saw him outside. And he hasn't seen me since I did that. He hasn't got any phone calls from me. Hasn't got any updates. Nothing. He don't even, he, I'm pretty much a stranger to him. Okay? I don't call to check in on him. I don't, put, I don't do anything with that. Well, what I've done is I'm this discount internet realtor. I, I basically, I do the bare minimum. 
Yeah, I may get him a little bit off his commission. So instead of 50000 Mr. Eugene, I'll let you pay me thirty five. But I'm not going to do any work. Okay? Well, what happens? Well, Mr. Eugene, if you see that I got a paycheck for 35000 and didn't do jack crap, then what are you going to do? So this boat. You're going to sell it yourself. You're going to do it for sale by owner. Well, if he can do it, anybody can do it. And he puts it on a site like Zillow, Realtor.com, or any other site you can get access to. He just puts it out there himself. I'll keep that money. So when you go out there, and this is what you got to understand as real estate agents, and this is everybody that's listening in this room, even all in life, even myself. I have to remind myself this stuff. We are now no longer competing just against other realtors. We're now what? So we're competing against our sellers. But here's the thing, is Travis, if the standard for 70 to 80% of realtors is here, do you have to be up here? Yeah, you only need just a little bit above it. So if that means that you happen to go in, Travis, and you say, well, you know, Mr. Eugene, we not only go and list on the MLS and put a sign up, but we also list your property on Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and I go out and I hand out flyers and all for you. Well, what's, what has Travis just done? He's already done what? He's already a little bit above the other group. So who are you going to hire if you have the choices of all Stefan's going to do is just put it on the MLS or Travis, who came out and is going to put it on the social networking, who are you going to hire? Travis. Because the fact is, is what? He's above and beyond already. Just imagine if Travis came out in a suit and tie and a nice folder and, and had all this stuff together, and he's doing a very, like, he's got his, his iPad out, and he's showing his stuff, and he's going, doing a presentation. Oh, he's blowing them away. He's blowing them away. Okay. So in that situation is you have duties to go through. Another thing is telemarketing, okay? So again, there is what's called the no call list. And these are numbers that are listed permanently. Again, cell phone numbers are generally barred. Internal do not call list must be maintained. Telephone numbers must be transmitted. And robo call is prohibited without written permission. Some exceptions for the real estate agents are provided, but again, not advisable that you end up, that you actually go in here and do telemarketing unless you know what you're doing. Okay. Further, you can't do junk fax. You can't send, I remember when faxing came out and I remember working at the lawyer's office and we'd get so much crap coming through our fax machine, it drove me nuts. Because what happens? You got to put ink in that thing and you got to put paper and then somebody just sent you junk and what happened? Now you just wasted that ink and that, that trap or the ink and that paper. Okay. So Junk Fax Prevention Act is that it restricts against faxing unsolicited advertising. So Travis can't sit down and be like, ooh, I'm going to go get a fax machine. I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to keep faxing this to every number. Wouldn't that be cool though, Travis? Just sit there and just send it all out for yeah. a name and all? But what's eventually going to happen? Travis is probably going to get a pretty nasty phone call. Okay. So there are exceptions, though, is if you have an established business relationship or if the recipient gives consent, you can send them stuff. Okay. But you have to contain an opt out provision on the first page. Imagine if, Travis, you were doing a a, a listing like trying to recruit somebody or tell them about your open house and you sent them like five pages and a fax. Wouldn't that have been so fun back then? Yeah. Y'all it happened. I'm serious. I remember that crap. There was one company I worked for one lawyer that we would get at least a hundred pages of fax and just a different junk every day because everybody's offering their services. Thankfully that's gone. Okay. Again, email, same, same concept, although it's not in paper, it's an electronic version. You can send emails so long as you follow can spam. 
Okay. So it establishes the requirements for emails that advertise. You, it does not prohibit unsolicited commercial emails, but emails must not contain a false, deceptive, or misleading subject line or falsified routing information. Okay. So what happens is, is I can send an email to Miss Leela. I can send her an email that is soliciting for her to hire me. But guess what? I got to put at the very first part of my subject line. A D B colon. What does that stand for? Huh? Advertising. So when you see A D B, that is advertising. It's a notice to tell you this is an advertiser. You also in the email have to have an unsubscribe button or a way for a person to unsubscribe. So Travis, you could send out millions of emails to a ton of people about your new listing, but you have to do what? It has to say ADV and it has to have a way for that person to unsubscribe. Now, does it have to be a formal deal? No, it could simply be as if you no longer wish to receive these emails, please email Travis Stahl. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Again, the messages must contain a free opt-out provision, as we said. The message must clearly indicate that it is an advertisement. And Texas, again, requires ADV as the first four characters of the subject line. If you do not include those four characters, you can get into trouble. It is highly recommended that you end up, if you want to keep in compliance, to use a software program like MailChimp or uh, Constant Contact or any of those different types of software platforms because they keep you up to date. Does everybody understand that? Okay. All right. So that ends our lecture for tonight. Can you go ahead and stop our recording?